Professor Burke, welcome back in Holland. You have been involved for a large part of your career in the research into cancer and afterwards in uh, nature's defense against cancer. Uh, why aren't pharmaceutical approaches to cancer as successful as we would like so far? The chemotherapy agents don't attack cancer cells selectively. They attack any sort of cell that replicates itself rapidly and in your body you've got some very important normal healthy cells that uh, replicate themselves rapidly. These are knocked out by the chemotherapy and that's the main reason for all the, the side effects and that's a, a limiting toxicity. It limits the effectiveness. Let's take a look at the source of the problem. Why is cancer fatal? I think if we look at the molecular level of things, the problem is that cancer cells disobey the commands of the body. So normal cells will replicate until they occupy the space in the body that is intended for them and at that point they will stop. Whereas the cancer, cell, cancer cells keep on replicating, they just grow and grow, they, they don't know when to stop. Also, normal cells do get worn out, uh, they do become dysfunctional, sometimes they become damaged. Sometimes something happens to them and they become dangerous to the body. And the body has a brilliant uh, fail-safe mechanism that kicks in. It's called apoptosis. And it kicks in when a cell is dangerous or worn out or damaged. And it kills off the cell in a way that is safe to the body. But in cancer cells, that fail-safe mechanism doesn't kick in they don't do apoptosis. So the body's normal way of restricting the growth of a tissue doesn't work in cancer, so they just keep on growing and growing and growing. And what is now considered one of the most important reasons why cancer is too often fatal is that we just don't pick it up soon enough in the patients. It's now recognised that there are severe technological limitations to the sensitivity of even scans and biomarker tests and the like. And we're not picking up cancer by and large until too far in to its growth period. It, it's too close to getting big enough to kill you before we can recognize it. The death that comes from cancer uh, comes about simply when the uh, number of cancer cells in the body is so great that they damage the vital organs of the body, the, the organs no longer function. The pain, the serious pain that comes about uh, towards the end stages of cancer is, is because the, the cancer cells are pushing on the, the pain nerves of the body. What has been your own biggest discovery in the field of cancer research? Oh, I think that's easy to answer. My research colleagues and, and I in the University of Aberdeen in the early 1990s, uh, we made a discovery uh, about a, a protein called CYP1B1. We didn't discover CYP1B1, that was a couple of Americans, Greenlee and Sutter. But what we discovered was a, a characteristic of it that to all intents and purposes, there is uh, little or no CYP1B1 protein in our normal cells, but there's plenty of it in our cancer cells. Now with the passage of time and the, the development of more sensitive detection techniques, uh, it is, one would say that CYP1B1 protein is highly overexpressed in cancer cells compared to normal cells. With that knowledge, it could provide a very early detection method uh, uh, for detecting if someone has, uh, has cancer. How did this later lead to the discovery of cell vegetables? Uh, my very brilliant uh, colleague, uh, medicinal chemist, I'm a pharmacologist, uh, I do the testing, he does the designing and synthesizing. Uh, he, he came into the laboratory one day and said, you know, I think we're going to find the equivalent sorts of new types of uh, anti-cancer compounds in many of the fruits and vegetables that we eat. Uh, let me try and explain. Uh, I think everybody knows about the lock and key model for drugs acting at their targets. You know, the, drug, the drug is the key, the target is the lock, uh, the teeth uh, in the key have to be the right configuration uh, to open the lock. Uh, and that, that's how it is uh, for, for, for all pharmaceuticals. But if you think about it, 
the rest of the key can be any shape you like. As long as the teeth are correct, the handle and the shaft of the key can be any shape you like. And, and that's really what he was meaning. So in a typical pharmaceutical drug, you've got between, what, 25 molecule, uh, atoms to 50 atoms. But probably only about five or six of those atoms really are crucial. They make up the key, the, 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 the teeth. That they have to be in a certain three-dimensional configuration. And so he felt that we, in a, t in a, a typical uh, sort of um, natural compound, that uh, polyphenol type compound that you'll find in fruit and vegetables, um, we were likely to find compounds that had that same five or six atoms in the right tooth arrangement. And uh, when we went looking, uh, he was right, we found them. Remember I'd said that cancer cells don't do apoptosis. Well, uh, once you feed them salvestrols in the laboratory, uh, they do do apoptosis and they die. And that's how salvestrols seem to be able to kill the cancer cells. Uh, whereas with the normal cells, when we tested them, uh, remember there's not a lot of CYP1B1 in normal cells, if any, and so the, the, there was, the salvestrols didn't get activated. Um, and and that, that's where we are now. And uh, where can cell vessels be found and what are they? They're polyphenols, they're natural polyphenols, which is actually a, a huge group of compounds. It's a very large generic group. Um, there are some very specific uh, structural attributes to salvestrols, and we think there's no more than 50 of them out of the 100,000 or so different polyphenols in the natural world. Uh, and uh, they're pretty broadly scattered amongst certain types of fruits, citrus, all the berries, um, uh, grapes and the wine, uh, vegetables, uh, most of the vegetables that you think of as being healthy, cruciferous vegetables and uh, olives are very good, and herbs, a lot of herbs, medicinal herbs, culinary herbs. But why does the plant make them? Well, probably not for our benefit. but. Uh, plants have a very, very sophisticated uh, chemical defense system against uh, bacteria, against uh, insects, against fungi, uh, pathogens that would damage the plant. And the salvestrols are part of this defense system against fungi. Would it appear that we are getting less salvestrols in our diet, and why is that? We think that for a fully healthy uh, existence, you need a certain amount of salvestrols from your diet. Uh, uh, in your body, you need, you need to have quite a few. So uh, they're broadly scattered, it, it shouldn't be difficult to find them, uh, but it is difficult. Um, because when we came to do our chemical analysis, uh, we found that there's a great deficiency in salvestrols in most of the modern fruits and vegetables. We think that nowadays we've probably got less than 20% of the salvestrol content that uh, was in the diet in Queen Victoria's time, and it's, it's a problem. Why that's the case, uh, we think that the main cul uh, culprit is the spraying of crops with synthetic agrochemical fungicides. If you spray a crop like that, you tend to kill off all the fungi in the field, and so there's no stimulus there for the plant to make the salvestrols. And that's, we think, the main reason why the content of our modern diet is very low. There's a few other reasons. Um, manufacturers of fruit juices that ordinarily have quite good levels of salvestrols deliberately uh, de-bitter the, the fruit juices in the manufacture. They remove bitter tasting compounds. And in the doing so, they also remove the salvestrols. We have uh, analytical evidence that uh, newer varieties of fruit, for example, apples, tend to be sweeter. And uh, they've lost a lot of their salvestrols over, over centuries, I suppose, during development. And if we, if we boil up our vegetables in water too long, we, uh, we extract the salvestrols and pour them away down the sink. And we probably don't eat enough natural, organically grown uh, fruit and vegetables. I think everyone's familiar with the concept of empty calories. Um, we stuff ourselves with, with uh, manufactured synthetic food, if you like, processed food, 
that has calories and no nutrition. So that's, that's the problem. We're just not getting enough cell vegetables, we think, naturally in our diet. And how much should one take in a normal situation? It's actually more difficult to, <laughs> to answer than it, it seems because not all cell vegetables are of equal potency. In fact, in laboratory testing, some uh, are thousands times more potent than others. And when we eat an apple or, or an olive or whatever, we're getting a mixture of salvestrols. It's not the same mixture necessarily in different fruits and vegetables. So ra it, it doesn't mean anything to say so many milligrams of salvestrols. So we've devised a, a, a scale, which we just call salvestrol points, which takes into account not only the weight, but also the potency, the relative potency of the salvestrol. And we estimate that on that scale, uh, for a healthy existence, it's probably best to have uh, no less than 350 salvestrol points worth. Uh, but in pra uh, on, uh, per day. In practical terms, this probably means eating your five to ten uh, fruit and veg, but to ensure an adequate salvestrol intake, they would have to be organically grown. Uh, so it's quite hard. Professor Burke, thank you very much for your time.